Hi everybody, it's me, Dean Miller, the Dog Counselor, and as promised on my last episode, <laughs> I said I would bring my uh, challenging dog, my most challenging dog, and this is her, her name is Penny, I take no responsibility for how she's going to behave, uh, unfortunately it's her brother Flip who is giving me the most problems right now because he can't stand that his sister's on TV and he's not. He thinks because the leash came out and she's on it that we should all be going for a W-A-L-K and because we're not, everybody's acting crazy. Hey, sit, stay. I thought that the, uh, it might be nice and beneficial to you guys to see uh, that a dog trainer can have challenges with his own dogs. So, I am here bringing on my uh, letting you see me warts and all as a dog trainer who might have a couple of challenges with his own dogs. Now the dynamic that's happening right now is I've actually got Penny under control and she's usually my most troubled child. But because she's sitting here on a leash, Flip is running around wanting to go for a W-A-L-K. So we're going to have to calm that down and hope it calms down during this episode. Welcome to episode four, I believe, of the Dog Counselor here on the Wolf Driver channel. I am, you can't see it over here, but I'm surrounded by my dogs. I've got Henry, Kirby, Flip, and back here is Penny, my trouble dog. I may let her go in a minute if she keeps causing trouble with her brother. But um, I, I brought Penny this week for a very specific reason. To let everybody know that I am a dog trainer, first of all, and that I can talk a good game and I teach very well, but we all have challenges in our lives and we all have the, those difficult dogs. Penny, sit. Thank you. So Penny is one. And Flip is instigating it now. So you can see Flip. Flip really wants to know what's going on. This is very strange to him. But I wanted to give you some advice and let you know that um, when... And you can, if you could see this right now, it's pretty funny. Flip is rolling on the ground, so frustrated, scratching his back, rolling in circles like the Three Stooges, just trying to get my attention here. Um, but I wanted to show you a little bit of chaos in the life of a dog trainer because... Even though I, I know what I'm talking about, I've been doing this for many years, we're all given challenges with certain dogs in our lives. So if you're having challenges with your dogs, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world, it doesn't mean it's a problem, it just means that you're human and your dog is a dog. And it is not an exact science. Dog training is not an exact science. It's a relationship. Your relationship to your dog is a give and take. They are creatures of freedom of choice, just like we are. And so it's never going to be 100% perfect. I always say I can train your dog perfectly and get them to do behaviors on command and be very reliable and everything's perfect. And then one day they just go, squirrel, you know. So um, just like all of us, we have imperfections and so do our dogs. So we have to be very forgiving. We have to love our dogs like family members that they are. Even Penny, who is really a challenge. Penny, go back up to your spot, okay? Penny, right there. Good girl, stay. No. Stay. 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 So, um, Penny may not last the, the, the whole time because I can't talk and train at the same time. Sit. Stay. Lay down. Good girl. Stay. And Flip is really bothered by the fact that his sister's on TV and he's not. Sit. Lie down. Lie down. Penny. Lie down. See? Okay. So, Penny is my Lucille Ball dog. She is. She bounces off the walls, she challenges me at every turn, she doesn't always listen, and she can be a real challenge. So I just wanted you guys to see that. I may let her go and play with her brother for a bit. Why don't you go play with your brother? Um, so that she doesn't interrupt the TV show right now. She may just want to be with me. I don't know, let's see, what do you want, Penny? No, she wants to be with her brother. They're gonna go do some wrestling while we talk. Um, if you hear the wrestling in the background, I allow that. I let it lets them get some energy out. They may knock over the camera in a minute, that's okay. It's all part of live streaming, isn't it? Um, but I want to let you know, hey, guys, stop. I want to let you know that um, even for a dog trainer, even for the best trained dogs in the world, you can have imperfection. Um, here, oh, they're knocking the camera now. So, um, even with imperfection, it doesn't mean we should get frustrated. It doesn't mean we should yell at our dogs. It doesn't mean we should get upset. They're just being dogs. And you have to remember that when we bring a dog into our home, we're bringing an animal into a human world and we're asking them to deny much of their own instincts, um, suppress a lot of their instincts and their nature in order to live with us and make us happy. 
And they're among the only creatures on the earth that I know of that will deny their own nature because they love us so much. And I believe that's why they do it, because they love us so much and they want to make us happy. Um, dogs are beautiful and complex and emotional, and we have to take that into account when we're forming a relationship with them. We can't just expect them to be controlled like machines and learn everything just perfectly right off the bat. I think puppies can be the most challenging. I'm working with somebody right now, a family who just adopted a 10-week-old puppy, and at 10 weeks old, the puppy is just not ready to learn everything. The puppy's crying at night in the kennel. The puppy is, you know, going to the bathroom and having accidents. It's just par for the course. It does about as much good to scream at a puppy as it does to scream at a baby wearing a diaper. Uh, they just are what they are, and we have to meet them where they are. Um, I've made a couple of notes here that I wanted to mention to, uh, uh, that I wanted to mention, uh, refer to. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Um, right on this uh, absolute, on this topic that we're talking about. Um, you know, we don't often take into, co into consideration what are our dog's needs. We get a dog and expect them to, um, to conform to our needs. But we need to meet a dog where they are with their needs. And um, some of the things that you might consider that you might not, that we might not consider when we're getting a dog is, um, hey, guys, enough. Hey, enough. They just had dinner, so they're full of energy and they're trying to get their dad's attention by wrestling and whining and, and jumping around. So stop. Um, but I wanted to talk about your dog's needs as opposed to human needs. Now, human needs are based on you know, social interactions, complexity of thought, complexity of, uh, of our, our agenda. You know, we have a very verbal mind. We have a mind that's based on a lot of thinking and a lot of, um, you know, overthought. I know a lot of people who worry too much. I'm guilty of that sometimes. We project into the future. We worry about the past. We have all of these things that dogs don't have. They don't do any of that stuff. Um, but they do have considerations that often we don't consider when we're working with our dogs. For example, they smell hundreds and hundreds of times the level we can smell. They smell things at a distance and in a detail that we can't even fully understand. Um, the best analogy I ever heard is if a dog walked into a room, into a kitchen, and there was a pot of beef stew on the stove, um, a person would walk in the room and say, oh, I smell beef stew. A dog would walk into the room and say, um, I smell half an onion, uh, uh, some beef sliced up, uh, two cups of water, I smell a little bit of garlic, I smell... They can smell the ingredients, separate them, and hone in on what each of those things are. You know, um, they've, been, they've done tests where um, they have tracking dogs or dogs that can identify human beings. And there have been dogs that a person can touch a piece of glass and that dog can identify who and who has touched that piece of glass six weeks later. So my point in talking about all of this is if they are overwhelmed with that much smell, for example, imagine how overwhelming it is to come into a home and smell cleaners and detergents and toothpastes and cologne and all of these things. Um, you know, imagine all of these things. Uh, they're overwhelmed. So just by arriving in your home, they're overwhelmed by smell. Okay, I think that's why you see a lot of puppies and dogs not being able to focus and, and just looking all over the place and having a hard time because imagine, you know, our primary instinct is sight or sometimes sound. And imagine if you were overwhelmed with sight and sound, well, you'd have a really hard time focusing, wouldn't you? Well, a dog has the same thing. I, I think that happens a lot when a dog is relaxed in the house, they're doing fine, everything's gentle, and then we open up the door and the dog just goes nuts outside because they're inundated with smell. So we need to start to think about um, what a dog is experiencing and why that may affect um, what, what their behavior is. So we need to think in terms of what their viewpoint is and, and why it might affect their training, their teaching, their relationship with us. I, I guess what I'm saying is we need to have patience. And if you have empathy for these different uh, things that the dog is experiencing, maybe you'll get more patient in your approach. Um, you know, other things we don't think about are sound. You know, a dog can hear three and a half to four times the level we hear. So if 
we're hearing something that sounds loud. The dog is hearing it like a sonic boom. It's overwhelming, you know. So, you know, if I say hey to you, it might sound like hey to a dog. So we don't need to be loud or raise our voices. I'm a big believer in not yelling at your dog. I don't think raising your voice and shouting and, and, and being loud help the training at all. I think that um, it's a matter of tone and intensity of tone. But I certainly don't think that uh, being loud and screaming are, are helpful to training in any way. By the way, I want to take a moment to say that I will be taking your questions. If you, I see some people are already commenting and questioning in a way I hear uh, there are tons of people on here. But if you'd like to ask some questions about training or about what we're talking about, or if you'd like to interact, I will be getting to your questions and comments. Um, I love it when you guys comment. I mean, it seems like this audience is just growing every episode, and I just, I'm overwhelmed with the people who are writing and calling. Um, I want to remind you of my website, which is thedogcounselor.com. I am very available to come and train and teach or talk to you. I do seminars. I travel all over the country. I am based in Nashville, Tennessee. I can, uh, I can really go anywhere around the Nashville area for a pretty inexpensive cost, and I am willing to travel uh, wherever you would like me to go in the world. So let's get back to our list here. Um, dogs are extremely sensitive. Uh, they're very emotionally intuitive. They hear sound more intensely than we do. They hear smell. They smell smells as, more intensely than we do. And I think oftentimes that overwhelms them and distracts them um, when we're trying to teach and train them. I think that's why tra uh, treats and food work so well. Um, oh, there's, there's Flip behind me. Flip's decided to come up and hang out and explore a little bit. He may join me on the broadcast. He's usually the calm one tonight. He's the one being the most active. And here comes Penny. Uh, just a side note here. Penny and Flip are brother and sister. They were from the same litter. And um, they were found together running in the streets when they were about three months old. They uh, are inseparable. Uh, they really, really are a bonded pair. They sleep together. They have to be touching all the time. They're always with each other. They have um, the most beautiful bonded relationship. It's kind of like a big brother, little sister relationship. She's sort of the, don't tell her I said this, she's kind of the goofy one. And um, the flip is the uh, the the calm, uh, protective brother. He looks out for her when we go to the park. He looks out for her when people come over. He looks out for her with all the dogs. He's a, he's a big brother type of figure. Um, and she's just goofy, but I love her. I love them both. I love all my dogs. So let's get back. I, t I tend to bounce around a lot. Sorry about that. But um, I am taking your comments, and I am uh, happy to, to answer any questions. I see here that Janice... Nichols is with us. Hello from Softwood, British Columbia, Canada. I am not familiar with Softwood. I am, however, uh, oh, what does that say? Sparwood. Sorry, I guess that was a typo. Sparwood, British Columbia, Canada. I'm not familiar, but I am familiar with British Columbia and Canada. Um, I know a lot of people from Canada. I've been to Canada several times. I love Vancouver. I think it's beautiful. Um, but anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about, let's say we talked about sound. You know, sound is really intense. You'll see a lot of dogs that are terrified of fireworks or thunder. Um, Flip, for example. Oh, Flip's gone. Flip is uh, very uh, scared of thunder and fireworks. He doesn't like loud noises. Um, and their hearing is very intense. So, you know, when we're training, we don't want to be loud and scream at them or make a lot of loud noises. I hear a lot of training advice that um, people shake things at their dogs or, you know, yell things or get real dominant. And I just don't think that's as powerful as a change in tone um, or intensity. You don't have to yell and scream. Um, I would say also, here's something to really consider when you're training. Um, this is more, uh, uh, today's conversation is more about philosophy and thought and less about the actual mechanics of training. Um, but I think they're good things to think about when you're teaching your dog and having a relationship with your dog. Um, something that people often don't think about is what is your dog's agenda, all right? A human agenda says, for example, don't go to the bathroom in my house. A dog's agenda says, mark everything you can with your smell and make sure everyone knows this is my house and it smells like my urine, right? So we have opposite agendas, humans and dogs, and where that's concerned. So it's perfectly natural for a dog to want to um, go to the bathroom in your house. It's not natural for them to hold it and wait till they go outside. But in my belief, they do it because they love us so much, because they respect us, they begin to learn our rules, and they begin to learn that we are the leaders and they're the followers. 
and I am just a um, I'm just a firm believer in taking training from the dog's point of view and their agenda. Um, I often think a dog is kind of sitting there thinking, why should I? You know, why should I do that? What's in it for me? Um, you know, often we appeal to their greed. We give them treats. We give them love and affection and attention for their behaviors. And we withhold that or make corrections when they don't, when they do the wrong thing. Um, and so dogs, more so than humans, are very black and white. It's really positive, negative, right, wrong, good, bad, hello, Flip. That's my buddy. I love Flip. Um, and so we want to really kind of think from a dog's point of view, what motivates the dog? Well, humans are motivated by things that are um, very intangible. I mean, I think it's bizarre that humans are motivated by things like money and power and prestige and things that a dog doesn't care about, you know? A dog has no idea how wealthy you are, how famous you are. A dog is listening to you because of what you're presenting. Are you someone worth loving, someone worth respecting? Are you someone that the dog um, loves and listens to? Or are you a dominant person, a submissive person, a fearful person, a strong person? They're looking at who you are, what you're presenting. And I think that's part of why we love dogs so much, because they cut through all of that illusion, all of those masks, all of those social things, and they really, really cut to the heart of who we are and our communications and, and who we are. Um, so a dog's agenda, if you'll think in terms of, you know, I always say to my clients, we know we live in a nice neighborhood with locks on the door and everything's safe, but your dog is an animal and their first instinct is survival, okay? So every knock on the door, every pe postman that comes by, every exterminator that walks in your house, that could be somebody coming to kill us as far as a dog knows, at least in the beginning until they become acclimated to the fact that these are not threats. And a dog is most likely to give up their uh, fear of this or their need to protect. They're most likely to give that up when you demonstrate that you're more equipped to handle it, that you're strong, and that these people are no threat, and through repeated exposures and you taking control, the dog begins to relax about it. But in the beginning of training, a dog's instinct is survival, and what they're trying to do is let that person know, I see you, you can't get one over on me, you, can, you can't hurt me, you know. So in that sense, our agenda is first to let a person think we're really nice, but a dog's agenda is to let them know they can't get one over on them. You, you can't attack me. Now, of course, dogs over time get acclimated to human interaction and love, and they start to think, hmm, when the doorbell rings, maybe they're here to see me, maybe they're here to give me affection, maybe they're here to love me, and so that begins to dissipate and turn to excitement, which is a whole other problem. But um, just think in terms of your dog's uh, inner needs, inner desires, train from that point of view, and have a lot of patience where that's concerned. Um, I wanted to take a moment to talk about my book. I put a lot into this book. I wrote a book called A Dog's Way. It's available on my website, thedogcounselor.com, or on, um, on uh, amazon.com. Now I have my pal. I know. I love you, pal. You're very beautiful. This is Flip. He's very beautiful. And Kirby's getting jealous. I know you're jealous. It's okay. Four dogs, always something going on. And right before tonight's episode, they ate. So they're full of energy and they're wanting dad's attention, but dad's on TV, so dad's a little busy. Um, but this book, A Dog's Way, uh, it's subtitled, How Dogs Make Us Better People. And it is less a how-to training book. It is more a book about, um, about our relationship with dogs and how they make us better when we tune into who they are and what they are. So, um, oh, that's, that's Henry. Can you see that? That's me holding Henry on my shoulders. Henry's my other dog. Um, I found Henry in the street. He was on the episode before last on Wolf Driver. Um, but anyway, I'm digressing. I tend to bounce around a lot. I wanted to read something from my book that I did not write. But I included this quote in the book because it just sums up so much about how I feel about dogs. Um, this is from an author named Gene Hill and from something he wrote called Tears and Laughter. And Gene Hill writes a lot about dogs. But this is a paragraph that I included in the introduction to my book and I wanted to share it with you because I just think it's so beautiful. It's about dogs. So, um, He is my other eyes that can see above the clouds, 
my other ears that hear above the winds. He is the part of me that can reach out into the sea. He has told me a thousand times over that I am his reason for being, by the way he rests against my leg, by the way he thumps his tail at my smallest smile, by the way he shows his hurt when I leave without taking him. I think it makes him sick with worry when he's not along to care for me. When I am wrong, he is delighted to forgive. When I'm angry, he clowns to make me smile. When I'm happy, he is a joy, unbounded. When I am a fool, he ignores it. When I succeed, he brags. And without him, I am only another man. With him, I am all-powerful. He is loyalty itself. He has taught me the meaning of devotion. With him, I know a secret comfort and a private peace. He has brought me understanding where before I was ignorant. His head on my knee can heal my human hurts. His presence by my side is protection against my fears of dark and unknown things. He has promised to wait for me whenever, wherever, in case I need him. And I expect I will, as I always have. He is just my dog. The only thing I disagree with in that whole paragraph is the word just. He is not just my dog. He's my everything. My dog is a family member. He's my heart. He's everything to me. So let's take this moment to talk to some of the people who've been writing in. I'm getting behind on these comments. Um, let's see here. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I can't catch up here. Okay. Um, oh, hi. Hi to my dogs. Everybody's saying hi to my dogs. Um, um, let's see. She looks like a cookie monster. Oh, what kind of breed are they? Okay. Penny and Flip, there's no way of knowing for sure what kind of breed they are because they were found in the streets. But I believe they're part Rhodesian Ridgeback um, because they have toes and knuckles that look just like a Rhodesian Ridgeback. If you're not familiar with that breed of dog, they were originally bred to hunt lions in Africa. Um, they look just like miniature Rhodesian Ridgebacks. But if you look at them in the sun or in a bright light, or as I have, I have a picture of them standing on my door side by side, and you can see the line of a faint ridge down their spine. And Rhodesian Ridgebacks have a line down their spine where the fur grows backwards. It, it grows against the grain. And it's very unusual. I don't know why that's there. I'm sure someone could tell me. Maybe someone could write in if you know the, the reason for that. But Rhodesian Ridgeback have, Ridgebacks have that ridge of fur that grows the opposite direction of the rest of their fur. Penny and Flip's fur all grow the same direction, but they have a faint line down their spine where you can see that maybe a generation or so back that they had Ridgeback in them. So I believe they're part Rhodesian Ridgeback. Um, let's see here. What else do we have here? Oh, she looks just like my baby that's a Sharpe pit bull, but okay. Her name is Bella. Uh, hi. Oh, they want to go out and play? Yes, they do. Uh, blah, blah. Let me see here. Um, oh, my, my dog is not afraid of noise, but she still has other issues, including marking the carpet. Okay, let's talk about marking the carpet. Um, first of all, I would ask if the dog returns to the same spot or is it different spots every time. Um, if it's the same spot or similar spots, that's often easier to correct um, because if they're marking the same spot, they're kind of claiming that um, it's a routine that you can break. Um, but here's what I would say. You want to do several things. First of all, until the uh, urine problem is solved, you want your dog to be supervised or contained supervised or contained. So they're either contained in a safe room, a laundry room, a room that can't be destroyed, a room, a room with a tile floor or something, but you want them to be in a room that can't be destroyed. Um, and you want them contained there or, or possibly a crate, a kennel or crate. And so if the dog is confined when they're um, not supervised, then the dog begins to learn to hold their urine because they don't want to be in their own waste. Okay, so that's part one. When you go to let the dog out of their contained environment, you want to take them outside to the same spot every time, and that same little spot will begin to smell like a toilet. And so every time you go there, it tells them to go there and not go in the house. Part two is if you see them in the act of urinating, you need to give them the opportunity to go to the bathroom. I hate to say that, but you have to catch them in the act so that you can say no 
and correct. And oftentimes we overcorrect. We say, no, 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 that's my carpet. No, 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 quit, quit, quit. But if it's just one sharp no outside, then no more talking. Take them out to the spot where they're supposed to go to the bathroom and, and let them relieve themselves. Now, most likely if they've just gone to the bathroom, they're not going to relieve themselves again. But you want to go through the ritual anyway. That's, part of, that's the part that is just basic house training. But because you have a problem now, you want to support it with a couple of other things that are going to help you. One is you want to bring the dog into the area where they go to the bathroom. You can't bring them there after they've gone or 10 minutes later or 5 minutes later and shove their nose in it or say no. They don't remember that. They don't recall that. But if you bring that, that dog into the room where they go to the bathroom on a leash and you walk them around the room with control and you tell them to sit and you tell them to come and you're and not in a sweet way and not in a mean way but in a confident leader type of way what I'm in, in uh, what I'm suggesting that you do is that you take over the room with your attitude so that you're owning the room so you bring the dog into the room and you say come sit move walk around the room on a leash I'm in control I'm doing this now my dogs are responding to this because they know all these commands you can relax it's okay guys but you want to bring them into the room and do all of that. Come, sit, move. So you're telling them, I own the room. I'm the alpha. You don't have the right to pee on my stuff. You can step between them and the spots they've gone to the bathroom. And then each time you do that, you're showing them you own the room. Now, in addition to that, I would bring a few treats or a little bit of kibble. And after I've cleaned up these urine spots, which you want to clean them up, by the way, I'm going to digress here for a minute. You want to clean them up with what's called an enzyme cleaner, like Nature's Miracle or Petzyme or one of those. A simple cleaner, carpet cleaner, does not work because as we talked about earlier, a dog smells hundreds of times what we smell. So if, they, if you don't get that smell out, they smell it and return and go to the bathroom over and over again. You need to get that smell out with something called uh, Nature's Miracle or Petzyme, but it's an enzyme cleaner with enzymes in it. Then, after it's clean and after you've done these exercises, put a little kibble or treats on the spot and have the dog eat off of there. You're sending several messages to their brain. One is, I own the room. I'm the dominant dog of the room. I'm the alpha. You don't have the right to go to the bathroom on my stuff. Plus, they don't like to, eat. So they don't like to go to the bathroom where they eat, so you're confusing their mind. You're putting food where they go to the bathroom, and they're not going to want to do it. Those are some simple, quick answers. If you want to talk in more depth about it, that's a really broad uh area to, that I've talked about or way I've talked about it, but if you want to talk in more detail, please contact me through thedogcounselor.com or through email, dean at thedogcounselor.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. I set up Skype meetings. I have Skype meetings where I can sit with you and train and, and talk to you. Um, I also travel for training. I can do a lot by email and phone. We can, we can find a way to help you with your dog. So let me see here. Um, ah, somebody, Annie Correa said, Correa? Correa? Annie Correa said, my dog is my soul. I completely agree. I, my dog and I have a connection um, that I can't explain. Um, a friend of mine once put it this way. They said that a dog is a portal to the other side. They're a portal to our spirituality, a portal to our emotions, because humans have masks and fronts and they hold back and humans are capable of deceit. Dogs are not. Um, so a dog is really the purest form of give and take. Even when they are vicious and biting you and hate you, they're not deceiving. They're not deceptive. They're showing you exactly how they feel about you. They're not capable of deceit. So let me see here what I got. Um, it says here, I didn't get to see the dog, show them again. They're finally just settled for the first time in 30 minutes of a show. I don't want to get them all excited again, but I promise you'll get to see them over these episodes in the future. It says here, our dogs are scared and thunder. Let me tell you something. Thunder is one of the hardest things to train because you can't control it. It's a noise out there. And it's very overwhelming to a dog. Um, the static electricity in their fur, the booming noise in their ears, the smell of lightning. It's a very big thing for them to overcome but I find there's they make a product called a thunder shirt that works with a lot of dogs it's a it's a shirt that basically goes on kind of tight a coat on the dog and it provides a little bit of pressure which um, this works very well with animals to provide a sense of comfort if you don't want to go so far as to try that because I've seen some dogs that works on and some dogs it doesn't um, my dog Flip is very afraid of thunder. I put my hands on him or hug him or give him a little bit of pressure. It seems to ease it a little bit, wrap him in a blanket. Anything that puts a little bit of pressure helps him. 
but nothing makes him completely content. And sometimes a dog just needs a place to hide, a place to get away from it that comforts them, and you just let them have that little corner of the closet or under the bed if that helps them. Um, there's no easy, really easy answer about this, uh, this thunder thing, but I do find a little bit of hugging and pressure. One of the worst things we can do is to say, it's okay, good girl, it's okay, because that sounds exactly like praise. Good girl, it's okay, okay. So it's almost like you're saying, I love it when you're upset. We want to say, you're fine, I got you, I'm in control, show them that you're strong. I see that I've already run out of time. I tend to ramble through 30 minutes and then it's all gone and I don't know what I've done. So sorry about that. We will get to all your questions and comments. I'm back on Sunday night at 6 p.m. Central Time. If you want to talk to the dog counselor, ask any questions, tune in. Um, in the meantime, if you want to send emails or call or talk, we um, just get on the dogcounselor.com. I'm available to help. Um, and um, thank you for tuning in. I want to thank the Wolf Driver and the whole Wolf Driver uh clan family team over there for letting me be a part of this. This has been a great experience and my audience is growing by leaps and bounds. So thank you a lot and I look forward to seeing you guys. Uh, Sunday is my next uh, broadcast. I'm on Thursdays and Sundays. Uh, Sunday is 6 p.m. Central Time. Thursdays are 8 p.m. Central Time. So come on and check it out every time if you want to uh, and tell your friends and neighbors. Okay, good to see you. We'll talk soon. Bye.